Awesome. We are live. Um, hello, everybody. This is uh, Terry. Uh, I'm CEO, Chairman, um, and Co-Founder of Deep Kappa AI Research. It's a research lab. And Real AI, that is a commercial entity uh, where uh, we develop cutting-edge AI, uh, where we develop cutting-edge AI algorithms and then convert these into products and solutions and services. So that's, that's who I am in case, you know, uh, you don't know me. And we are running this wonderful web webinar called Meet the Instructors of Human-Centered AI Masters, so H-C-A-I-M. So just to remind all of you guys, in case you've forgotten, uh, Human-Centered AI Masters is um, European Union-funded a multi-million euro project that we, together with our uh, very talented consortium partners, have have. Uh, one have been awarded to, should I say, or have been entrusted with uh, by EU to develop this uh, AI masters. Um, and without much ado, um, I, I want to sort of, uh, uh, I will go into uh, introducing you to our esteemed colleague, Tamash. He is, he's an expert in silent speech interfaces, as you can see the beautiful uh, um, slide deck presentation cover. And I'm sure you, just like me, are extremely excited to listen to what he has to say because there's some awesome deep learning stuff that we could learn here. But let's very quickly want to take, uh, you know, let's talk about the importance of ethics, especially in the time where society, uh, and you may have seen the Twitter acquisition, uh, you know, by a, a bunch of people who feel how free speech should be versus, you know, governments, uh, societies, uh, for instance, in Europe, uh, how we feel depending on how your definition of free speech is. Each definition seems to be very different. Um, one thing, um, I mean, as, as, as a physicist, as an astronomer, the one thing that I like to uh, at least remind myself is um, anything or everything you say should fit, fit an objective function. Um, you know, rants, uh, complaints, uh, all those things, um, I all call them subjective. Um, and, and they all have their weight and merit, um, and, and each uh, has his own opportunity to explain themselves, whether you are leaning towards one sort of uh, ideologies and beliefs or the other sorts. So this becomes very important for us to actually continue to keep, keep educating people around AI uh, and ethics, because ethics is not any more fancy topic. It's not any more some things, you know, you can just sit in a conference or a panel discussion and start throwing, you know, examples of why does Google's AI, you know, detect uh, black people's faces as, as gorillas? And, and then suddenly everybody's into a very uh, embarrassing situation, people throwing apologies. Instead, how about we understand how AI and ethics work, not just in videos and images, but also speech. Um, so coming to speech, I would, I'm super excited to introduce you to um, uh, Tamash. He is, he's an expert. He's, he's, he's an associate uh, uh, professor at the University of BME, one of our esteemed partners in this consortium. So Tamash, without much ado, please uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. You know, the world is getting to know you, our, our community. Hi, everyone. So I did both of, both of my master's and PhD at uh, BME in, in Budapest, Hungary. And this is where I'm uh, teaching and doing research especially in the field of uh, speech technology, human computer interaction and, uh, and deep learning. Uh, in 2014, I was a Fulbright scholar in the United States where I started to do research about uh, ultrasound tongue imaging. And this became my research field, which uh, evolved to this topic of silent speech interfaces that I'm going to talk about uh, today. Uh, also at, at BME, I'm supervising several masters and PhD students in uh, related topics. And within the human-centered AI masters, uh, I will be involved in teaching deep learning and human-computer interaction. Awesome, um, this is perfect. Um, so I guess, you know, a bit of housekeeping for folks who are, uh, uh, you know, new to what human-centered AI masters is. Um, it is a fascinating opportunity for you to actually learn from talented folks like Tamash. Um, I, as an industry partner within this consortium, our companies as industry partner in this consortium, will help you learn about these things on a real hands-on basis. 
learning hackathons, so understanding complex um, sort of modalities and complex uh, with complex morphologies within how you understand data. And, and obviously we are trying to capture what humans are great in cognition, but let's kind of jump into this wonderful um, presentation and learn from uh, uh, Dr. Tamash uh, what he has learned in you know, his, his wonderful and great career and, and going forward. He's gonna teach you, He's going to, your, your students are gonna be in those universities, whether it's in, um, in, in Budapest or in, in, in uh, Naples or here in Utrecht in the Netherlands or, or in Ireland, uh, there's gonna be some wonderful stuff you will learn from him. So Tamash, please, without much ado, please go ahead. I'm really excited to listen to what you have to say. Thank you very much. So uh, this uh, talk, which is a result of, of a research with a couple of uh, people, you can see their names, they all, all contributed to this field from uh, several universities. So I'm going to summarize the recent results in silent speech interfaces and related human computer interaction and, and machine learning aspects. So first of all, a human computer interaction is about how we humans are interacting with the computer or more more nowadays uh, not with the computer but uh, smartphones smart devices and so on typically it can be like a graphical user interface or a touch user interface but what i'm especially interested in is how speech technology speech processing can be involved within a human computer interaction so speech technology means that uh, we would like to uh, replace some part of the human speech communication chain. This can be either uh, automatic speech recognition or speech synthesis. Um, talking about speech synthesis, <clears throat> text-to-speech synthesis, it has the idea that we would like to convert text to human-like uh, speech. And um, so there has been already electronic devices since the 1950s for this purpose. And also there are full software solutions since, since the 1990s. And uh, nowadays we can say that the, there are many, many text-to-speech uh, solutions for the main languages like English, German, and so on. Uh, not all of the languages of the world are covered, but at least if you have a smartphone, probably you can uh, easily meet voice assistants like Siri, Alexa, Cortana, and so on. So we can say that text-to-speech is a well-established topic. On the other hand, silent speech interfaces, which I'm going to talk about today, is a very, very much... Um, like a research area, and we only have prototype systems in this field. It is sometimes also called articulatory to acoustic mapping, which means that um, from some kind of articulatory signal, uh, which is, is the input of our machine learning system. What do I mean by articulation? When I'm talking, I'm using my lungs, my vocal folds, the uh, the part uh, above that, like the, the tongue, lips, teeth, uh, oral cavity, nasal cavity, and so on. And all of these, they are contributing with the muscles uh, the, to the resulting speech signal. And um, this uh, potential long-term application has the idea that uh, we will have a device which can record the soundless articulatory movement, and from it from which uh, with a machine learning model we can synthesize speech while the subject is actually not producing any sound so something like i'm speaking silently and after that there will be speech output so this is our scenario that we would like to work on <clears throat> in order to capture the articulatory uh, information uh, we need to have some kind of uh, biosignals and uh, <clears throat> so if you, you look at the, this sketch on the right, you can see that we can record the, like the movement of the vocal folds or the movement of the tongue, movement of the lips. There are many uh, possibilities. Some of them are more complex. Uh, some of them are, are simpler. Like the first one, it is called electromagnetic articulography, which has the idea that we are putting some coils on the tongue of the subject. And um, in the electromagnetic field around that, we can measure how the tongue or actually the, tongue, the coils are moving. This is quite a, quite a complex uh, method, but the results is very good. We have a lot of information about the tongue movement. Or we can have some kind of uh, measurement of the, uh, of the muscles around the face, like with surface electromyography, <clears throat> which is a different type of equipment. But here we have um, less information about the articulation itself. A very simple solution can, can be lip video when we are just recording the 
uh, lip movement or, or the face with the frontal camera. It's, uh, you can do all of this, this with, with your smartphone. So it's very easy, but uh, we have few information about the, the articulation. So ultrasound tongue imaging, which uh, I'm mostly interested in, is somewhere <clears throat> in between these um, different techniques. So it has um, relatively good uh, <clears throat> temporal and spatial uh, information. And also it's like an acceptable way of, of uh, capturing the information. <clears throat> For the silent speech uh, interface scenario, there are two typical ways how people are dealing with this. One of them is called direct synthesis, which um, has the idea that from the articulation, we would like to directly synthesize the speech as fast as possible. Um, with a small delay, which might be suitable for real-time applications. Uh, this will be important when we would like to go to a prototype or, or to a practical application. But also there is a different scenario called recognition and synthesis. Here, first from the articulatory signal, we are uh, getting the text information and with the standard text-to-speech synthes synthesis, we can, we can uh, generate very natural uh, audio, but here the delay might be longer and also there are more error possibilities. So within our research, we are mostly focusing on the direct synthesis approach. Hmm. Um, also, as you can see from this interaction, it's, um, it's a very complex topic. A multidisciplinary team is necessary. This is why on the first slide you could see that many colleagues were involved. There has to be someone who is who knows about uh, image processing, medical images, video processing, audio and speech, text processing, uh, data analysis in general. And what's very important nowadays that you, someone also has to know about machine learning and, and deep learning. And if you would like to go to a, a prototype application which uh, the final end users will use, then the user-centered design aspects will be also very important. Uh, now I will go to the details of, of our research. Mm -hmm. uh, ultrasound tongue imaging, it has been used since, since the 1980s. And the idea is that we are putting the ultrasound transducer, the standard medical ultrasound below uh, the chin. And uh, we can have uh, like a vertical information from the head, like in this uh, region. We are lucky because the ultrasound waves, they can go up through these muscles up to the top of the tongue. And the tongue movement, it will be visible on, on a video, which is roughly 100 frames per second. And also in the spatial resolution, it's like um, several megapixels. So we can say mm. that the, the tongue is well visible there. I will show you a sample ultrasound. Most a kuka meg a kuka volt. It was a Hungarian recording. What is important to see is that this uh, bright yellow line, which is the upper surface of the tongue, this is the front of the tongue, actually, this is the back of the tongue. And you can see that the tongue, while speaking, it is moving up, down, back and front. I will play it again. Hmm. So this is the information that we have about the articulation. This is our biosignal. Uh, the goal of our research in the past couple of years was to create so silent speech interfaces, <clears throat> or also called articulatory to acoustic mapping. Mm -hmm. uh, the input is ultrasound tongue images, as I have shown, and uh, with some kind of machine learning methods, we would like to synthesize speech. The, uh, the question is, what is the most optimal machine learning method or what is the most optimal representation of the speech signal? And uh, we have done many uh, smaller parts about that. Uh, so as, as the data, we had access to uh, to the equipment of the so-called Lingual Articulation Research Group, which is a, a group in Hungary uh, from uh, Hungarian linguists and, and uh, computer science people, like I myself, I'm also involved in that. And um, there we could record uh, ultrasound with several people. Um, and also we have access um, for the larger machine learning experiments to a large amount of uh, speech data also English and, and Hungarian speech. This will be mm. necessary for the final speech synthesis. Um, the ultrasound data, it's, it's captured in a way that, uh, so the ultrasound is like a micro convex uh, surface. The waves are going in a convex uh, way, but actually uh, we have a speci special equipment with which we can, access, we can have access to the very raw data, uh, which is good because um, 
it's easy to work with the uh, raw binary data for the for the deep learning experiments. Um, in the last couple of years, we have uh, presented this, this at uh, parts of this research at, at various uh, conferences, like uh, sometimes uh, we are using uh, fully connected neural networks, sometimes we are using convolutional neural networks or recurrent neural networks for the, for the purpose. And like iteratively, we are trying to uh, have better and better results in this field. Um, in the in the next part, I will compare two types of representation of the of the speed signal. One of them is called traditional vocoder, which means that uh, from the speed signal in the analysis phase, we would like to have a simpler representation. The problem is that uh, speech or audio, when we are uh, sampling it, for example, it at uh, twenty two uh, kilohertz, it means that it has twenty two thousand samples at a given second, and it's too much information. Uh, it's difficult to process that way. So like a vocoder, it can uh, decompose this to fewer information, which are related to the uh, frequency distribution, so like uh, spectral parameters, and also to some properties of the uh, how the human speech is working, like in the, in the vocal folds. This is done in the analysis phase. After that, these parameters are modeled with machine learning methods, and finally, in the synthesis uh, uh, phase, we are getting back the speech signal. The advantage is that these so-called vocoders, they are very fast. The disadvantage is that they are not fully uh, natural, so they uh, they add some, some distortions to the speech. Um, but it's uh, very easy to work with uh, those. So um, we did a lot of experiments with traditional vocoders. When the input is ultrasound tongue images, we are we have, for example, a convolutional neural network, and we are predicting mm -hmm. the spectral features of speech, and we get back to the synthesized speech. So in in the in this talk, this is our like baseline system that uh, that was the uh, simple approach. Uh, nowadays, also there are much more uh, advanced solutions for. Uh, for vocoding, they are called neural vocoder. And here the idea is that uh, a complex neural network is generating the final speech signal. And um, so this way the speech quality is uh, much more natural. The final uh, output can be can be uh, much better. For a long time it was there was a problem that they were computationally very, very expensive. But uh, nowadays we are lucky to have faster solutions which can already work real time. So with such an error of a coder, we are doing a, an analysis of the speech signal for the, we get the frequency components from the speech as a so-called mass spectrogram representation with Fourier transform. And um, in the analysis phase, we are again uh, using uh, deep learning for, for uh, the ultrasound to spectrogram mapping and um, in the synthesis, the um, mass spectrogram is uh, converted back to the speech signal. Mm -hmm. Now the details of the of the machine learning. Uh, here in this particular study, we were using simple 2D uh, convolutional neural networks. The input is the ultrasound image in the raw representation that I have shown you a few slides before. And we were experimenting with two types of uh, speech representations. There was the baseline vocoder and also the uh, advanced neural vocoder. The structure of the deep neural networks uh, was, was like following. There was uh, convolutional networks, max pooling, and fully connected layer at the end. Uh, fortunately, with a relatively simple neural network, we can already achieve acceptable results. But if you would like to go to more natural speech, it's also important to include the timing information, which can be done either with recurrent network or with a three-dimensional convolutional neural network. Mm -hmm. uh, now you can see a couple of demonstration samples. These are spectrograms of the speed signal. So the horizontal axis is uh, time, the vertical axis is a kind of uh, frequency representation. It's not in hertz, it's in uh, mass spectrogram representation. Anyhow, um, the uh, main thing what, what we should see is that the top is like an original speech sample and mm -hmm. the bottom is when we are resynthesizing this from uh, from the ultrasound input. You can see that the predicted signal 
is not as nice, uh, defined details are missing from the speech, but mm -hmm. at least um, it's um, uh, sometimes it is already intelligible, so we can understand parts of the content. As I said, it's a very, uh, very much research topic, so it's it's not like fully working and and uh, all, always working like uh, traditional yeah. text to speech. Yeah. Hmm. Now I would like to show you a couple of uh, speech samples. Um, uh, these are Hungarian samples, but you can uh, you will perceive like uh, what is the type of or difference between the quality of them. So first of all, I will play a original natural sample for a, from a female speaker. Az északi szél nagy vitában volt a nappal, hogy kettőjük közül melyiknek van több ereje. And after that. Uh, I'm also playing samples which are predicted by the machine learning from ultrasound input. First with a traditional vocoder. You can hear that it's much more muffled and difficult to get the, the finer details. Also with the neural vocoder, we can get a better, uh, higher naturalness. And also the, the results are very dependent on the, on the speaker. So for example, this female, it's uh, sometimes or, or more or less intelligible, but yeah. the other male speaker has a weaker result. So first a natural sample. Egyszer csak egy utast pillantottak meg, amint köpenyébe burkolódzva közeledett. And now the resynthesized samples based on the ultrasound input. <tos> And with a narrow vocoder. Of course, probably most of you are not Hungarian, so you don't understand the contents. Um, and also, as far as I can, we, we can tell Hungarian people also like understand half of what's going there. So it's um, more or less intelligible, but not not fully. So not suitable yet for for uh, real time communication. Mm. Mm. But also because it's a research study, we try to measure somehow quantify the, the quality of these synthesized simple samples. In uh, speech sam synthesis, one uh, typical way of quantifying it is the so-called Merkapstral distortion, which means that um, it, it's an error measure, so the lower values are better. And the, so if a number is lower, then it's more uh, similar to the uh, original speech. What we can say is that with the so-called wave glow uh, neural vocoder, we can achieve lower errors uh, than the traditional vocoder, so it's closer to the uh, natural speech. <clears throat> also, it's um, so usually for the for the machine learning systems, we are measuring objective numbers like what is the training loss or validation loss and so on. But when we do like a real system, it's very important that what will be the final end user, what do humans think about that? This is why in speech, speech synthesis, we always do a subjective evaluation. Here, for example, the task of the subjects was that uh, there is a reference sample and they have they can listen to a couple of different versions and they have to adjust the naturalness of the of the samples. Um, the result of this subjective evaluation can be seen here. Uh, now the horizontal axis is the different uh, systems and the vertical axis is the mean naturalness. So higher values means that it's more natural. The first bar is the natural speech. It's, it's very good. Um, there is a so-called lower anchor, which helps us uh, to, to tell why, like what is the uh, lowest quality that pe people can still perceive. And the gray is the traditional system. The two reddish bars, they are for the, for the neural vocoders. You can see that uh, they were preferred over the traditional vocoder, but still it's only 28, 30% compared to the 93 of the, of the natural speech. So the 22 subjects who participated in the, in the study, they also felt that it's, it's still far away from the fully natural speech. Okay, so as a summary of uh, this uh, research, we, uh, we trained convolutional neural network to predict mass spectrogram parameters from the ultrasound tongue input. Uh, we tested several uh, representations and from this, the so-called wave glow neural vocoder was preferred because it has higher naturalness. 
this was the uh, research study. But the question is that uh, we also have to think about the final end users, whether in terms of human computer interaction, whether anyone would use such a system. So the idea is that uh, silent speech inform interfaces, they might be a promising input method. If the acoustic signal is, uh, for example, unavailable, there are people with speech disorders like laryngectomy who cannot speak, uh, cannot speak but uh, they still have the articulate, articulatory organs there. They can use their tongue uh, to silently articulate, and such a system could be used for them. Or sometimes we are in a very noisy environment or in a public place where you would like to uh, talk like private information. Also, such a silent speech interface might be suitable for that. Um, many people are also interested in uh, the acceptability of uh, such silent speech, like in this uh, study at the computer is CHI uh, conference. They checked whether people are OK with the silent speech or not. And yeah. the result was that um, in, in, in uh, public environments, people are OK with silent speech. And, and also, they are um, <clears throat> more OK with tolerating errors in the, in the speech if it's important that it should be private and secure. Another aspect is um, from a Japanese research group is that, uh, okay, in my study, I was talking about uh, ultrasound tongue imaging and the ultrasound equipment is not very portable. So the problem is that, okay, no one would go on the street with the ultrasound equipment, but there are many other biosignals that can be measured. For example, this group, they designed a face mask that has a couple of sensors and they can measure uh, like articulatory, articulatory related information. And also with this uh, e-mask approach, they can uh, go through uh, towards silent speech interaction. Two weeks before, there was a lecture uh, here in this uh, series by my colleague Gergely Ach. And uh, he was also talking about the privacy aspects of machine learning system. I started to think about that, whether silent speech interfaces are uh, safe from this point of view. I have to tell you that it's not. <clears throat> so for example, if, if there would be an attack and we add some specific noise to, uh, to the ultrasound input, then it, it might spoil the final speech synthesis. So this is a research field that maybe some of the new students of, the, uh, of these uh, masters will solve in the future. Also, as I mentioned in the beginning, I'm teaching in some of the classes which are related to the human-centered AI masters. I would like to tell you, tell you a few words about them. Um, one of them is uh, deep learning that we are trying to teach in a very practical way. So, of course, we have theoretical lectures about basic architectures, but uh, more importantly, we are talking about uh, the tips and tricks, how you can uh, create efficient and, and optimized architectures or like hyperparameter optimization. Also, there are practical ex exercises and uh, during the semester, students have to solve five small homeworks and one large uh, homework in a group of uh, two free students. So it's, um, it's about they learn the theory, but more importantly, they already uh, start to apply this in, in practice in a very strong way. Uh, we are teaching it since uh, six years, and here there are 80 to 120 students at uh, BME. Mostly it's in uh, like in-person education, but uh, we have also uh, done this uh, remotely over Teams. The other course that I'm involved is human computer interaction. Uh, again, here we have theoretical lectures about basic user interfaces and also non-standard user in interfaces, or also maybe uh, smart glasses and augmented reality. But the emphasis is on the practical experience that you can gain. There is a large homework uh, that uh, students have to solve, and they go through the steps of uh, interview, storyboarding, prototyping, designing the application, and finally testing with the end users. Hmm. Some of the applications which are the result of uh, this course can be seen here. The left is a, is a music player application that uh, decides the music based on your mood. The right is um, an application which can convert uh, lip movement to speech, or which is trying to convert that. 
Also, there are many master's thesis topics related to silent speech inter interfaces and um, uh, either deep learning or, or machine learning. I'm providing some of them here. So for example, ultrasound to speech synthesis, lip to speech synthesis, comparison of various biosignals. Or from the deep learning point of view, whether we can use more advanced uh, deep learning solutions like generative adversarial networks or variational encoders for this uh, purpose. Uh, finally, on the Hungarian website of the uh, Human Centered AI Masters, you can uh, also see the related news. So if you are interested in this field, please join. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Tomac. Uh, this was uh, so fascinating. I actually, it exceeded my expectations. One, I the way you explained about how you have, uh, in fact, some of your students are already in the process of developing interfaces, uh, whether indeed through lip movement. I can only imagine the, uh, especially in a world where um, a lot of the world's sort of dialogue and, and et cetera is happening with sort of literally speech and not silent speech interfaces. Perhaps this could be a new paradigm over maybe a decade or two if there are better ways for folks to help each other communicate. And then I think in terms of, you know, the Web3 concept where the communication can also be in a private channel through RPC and can be between two people and you can uh, provide some kind of a, some form of a smart contract to, to try to sort of, you know, enable such form of communication, not just between disabled people, for example, I don't know. So for example, this practical exercise, right? So if I have this interface, um, like that guy, that young man you showed me, I think two years ago, uh, it was all over the news in MIT, and he was also walking into the stores with the, the jaw movement, and, and then that stuff is able to, I'm not sure how sort of realistic that was, but MIT, as you know, is very good in publishing and, um, and, and, and popularizing concepts because they have a great market reach. But nevertheless, if I am able to, Put that interface if i say some things in my mouth based on my tongue movement uh, i don't have to speak and that can be converted to speech based on the data set that has been trained based on the ultrasound movements and the way speech uh, the way uh, my tongue movement based on that ultrasound data set trained will be able to convert my speech right i'm not i'm not sure if i confused you for example let's say i'm saying something here so I, can, I said right now in my mouth, wow, Tamaj, what a great job. Will that be converted into, in, that can be converted into speech? Yes, this is the, the final idea. Of course, uh, now the research that we are doing, it's in a more um, very specific scenario. For example, all of the research that we are doing, it's very highly dependent on the orientation of the ultrasound transducer. So it's, it works if we are putting it here, but it probably doesn't work if it's like this way or that way or or, or like that. So ultrasound, I would say it's probably not suitable for a practical solution. But the, the other one that you mentioned, like from, from MIT, that might be. And, and also every year there are more and more uh, better sensors that are capturing like all of this information. And, and with our research, we are trying to uh, to give ideas to other people. So like, like okay, I'm working with ultrasound, which is probably not working in practice, but the, the machine learning aspects, the data analysis aspects, they are very similar for all of the, all of the biosignals. So, so other people might use those uh, ideas in their, in their other projects. So when you say sort of, if you were to look at the MTL or a multitask learning, I, uh, we are trying to do some things. I can, let me try to share my screen. Uh, how can I share? Uh, share screen, slides, extra camera. Oh yeah, Chrome tab. Um, common voice. Have you, you've taken a look at this data set, right? Have you guys done any experiments by sort of, you know, probably ensembling your model with uh, anything that is trained on this speech data set? This is a very common data set that Mozilla provides. Perhaps for multilingual support or something. For example, you, you convert that speech into text, uh, that speech into 
uh, from Hungarian to Italian, for example. I'm not sure. Yeah, that's uh, of course parts of part of uh, general speech technology, and uh, and and many of my colleagues are are working on that. Also, some of them are working with with Common Voice, Mozilla Common Voice. <clears throat> I'm not directly involved in that part because. Um, so for, for general text-to-speech synthesis, there are large enough databases like several hours that you are mentioned. Yeah. For, um, for uh, this particular sp- uh, idea of, of silent speech interfaces, it's mu- much more difficult to obtain the data. For example, with ultrasound, okay, we can record this uh, subject several minutes, but after that, they, they got uh, tired and, and it's not possible to have like several hours of recordings from the, from the sp- same speaker. Yeah. But I think it's a fascinating. Any other applications? I know our colleague Monica, she ha- also had a question. So I'll just paste her question here, if you can read it. Yes. Uh, so whether it uh, can be used for language disorders. Um, I, I'm not a linguist, but I know that uh, many of the linguistic uh, oriented research, for example, with ultrasound, they are interested in like uh, how they can help children to have better pronunciation. If, if, there, is a, if there is a disorder like a speed sound uh, disorder, then with the ultrasound biofeedback, you can, you can have that particular subject where they should put uh, the, the tongue in order to have a better articulation. Interesting. Wonderful research. I mean, as much as it's uh, still cutting edge, experimental as you guys are developing, I'm really hoping uh, to, to, to follow you and to see what you and your colleagues will be developing in the coming years. Uh, it's something you have a great understanding of. And obviously, when I looked at you know the last bit of the slides where you were explaining uh, about how you are so passionate about getting your students to be involved in it, it seems like uh, BME has a very passionate culture where students tend to kind of really start building stuff, which uh, which brings me to the next point. I'm really looking forward to being with you guys, uh, I think, end next month, uh, where their physical meeting is going to take place. Uh, really excited to to learn, to, to see all these wonderful colleagues there. And, uh, and also hopefully we can meet students if it's possible. But it's great. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Tamaj. I think <clears throat> um, I'm sure the audience, you guys also got a bit of a view of uh, one of what is being taught in this these universities, these wonderful universities. The BME is a university in Budapest. And, and do go up on our website. Uh, you, you just need to search. You can easily Google it, human-centered AI. Um, and and you, you can find it. Um, and, and there you can reach to the individual universities, uh, ask us questions, ask me questions here. And we're going to be sort of helping you uh, with your answers, uh, helping you guide to the university that best fits your needs whether it is in Naples, um, in Italy, whether it is in Utrecht in the Netherlands or Dublin in Ireland, and uh, obviously Budapest, where you've seen some wonderful colleagues. You you know, a few weeks ago, you had uh, Dr. Peter Aftal. Uh, he also gave a wonderful talk. So there's a lot of passionate people, you know, bringing in theoretical, statistical, and application-driven, and, and this in this specific case, very, very extremely sort of, you know, use case design centric kind of uh, uh, models. I mean, I think the future is super bright when it comes to seeing how, you know, great students are being taught. Ethics uh, will definitely play a key role uh, as, you know, we start having AI law. There is also um, um, uh, services, data services uh, act that is coming into play. Uh, there's going to be a law uh, soon in Europe. So all these um, applications and interfaces, we have to understand from ethical perspective and without using the fancy word. I mean, to be very honest, I'm a super technophile, guys. So you, you will never see me in, in an ethics conference. You never will. Um, and, and I don't care being in those conferences. What I'm trying to say is that if you are a great machine learning or deep learning engineer, you're actually building systems that are designed bottoms up to understand, interpret, explain, and potentially be allowed for interrogation. Now, let me close the talk by starting with the talk of Twitter. Now, let's say Elon Musk and Co. have their great intentions uh, in which uh, uh, you just had uh, 8,000 employees of Twitter who were trying to manage the, di- uh, the dialogue of the rest of the world. 
if he is willing to put that, which he says, and in fact, yesterday there was a there was a, a Twitter GitHub handle that that showed us, uh, at least that was saying that the algorithms will be uh, will be uh, made public for to allow us to also interrogate on and to ask questions about them. That is a great step, and and we're gonna see how how it ends, uh, you know. Because it's not just one man's story; it's about uh, a joint sort of uh, shared dialogue of people who have uh, decent intentions. Um, and then I always say, and let's close it with putting all that into an objective function, an objective mathematical function that will disallow you to to actually go into subjective BS. So from that perspective, I think uh, uh, speech definitely is a very, very fascinating topic. Uh, machine translation, et cetera, has been made a lot of progress and in, in speech uh, 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 is, is such an interesting area. In fact, you should talk to also Stefano uh, Tamash. If you, have, if you haven't spoken to him, he's also doing some really cool stuff in that area together with a bunch of guys in Italy uh, on, on some variables and all. But again, this is fascinating. Thank you so much, Tamash. Thanks, everybody. I believe people, um, this, I mean, if you see our colleagues also sharing this and, and the bunch of folks who have also listened to it, I hope uh, it was useful. Please follow um, Human Centered AI Masters. Uh, we have a handle, obviously, on, uh, on, on LinkedIn. Uh, but go onto the website, ask questions, connect to Tom Tomas, uh, and and you know reach out to him if you are a passionate speech uh, expert and or an enthusiast, uh, because I'm sure you know if that could be a route for you to take up your master's and perhaps someday even do a PhD at BME might be fascinating. Thank you very much, everybody. God bless. Take care. The world is uh, is unfortunately becoming a very difficult place. Uh, uh, but, you know, together we can make things happen um, and, and, and take care of yourself and your neighbors and love them. Thank you, Tomas. Uh, just hang on. Stay with me. I'll end the broadcast and we can wrap this up together. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thank you for the feedback. Goodbye. Thank you. Ciao.